In this uh, section, we are going to look at options market structure and what do we mean by options market structure? Well, there are several things with the options market that are very different from the stock market. There are some terminology that you would have never heard of in the, in the stock market. Um, we've seen that how long and short itself is very different in uh, the stock market and uh, the options market. In the stock market, long means you're, you've bought the stock, whereas in the options market, you could be long a call option, in which case you're bullish, or you could be long a put option, in which case you're bearish. So these are the kinds of differences there are. And in addition to that, there's a lot of other terminology like volume and open interest and exercise and assignment and things like that. So we are going to use a combination of the trading platform and these definitions uh, in this uh, lecture. Um, the bid price, ask price and the mark price is something that I would uh, discuss uh, on the trading platform. You've seen a little bit of the bid price and the ask price uh, and I'm going to show you the mark price as well. And the expiry series also you've seen there are weekly expiry series there are quarterly expiry series and there are monthly expiry series. So all of these provide a lot of flexibility if you wanted to structure an options trade. So the expiry series is also fairly straightforward and we've seen that already. The concept of exercise and assignment is um, a little uh, involved and I'll briefly explain here what that means. So whenever you buy a call option, you're buying the right to buy the shares at a certain price. As you approach expiry, let's say your call option is in the money. So which means if Apple was trading at $500 and you bought a, uh, at the money option at $500 and now Ap Apple has gone over 500, it's gone to 525 or it's gone to 550, then your call option is in the money and you have the right to buy the shares at 500 and why won't you do that if you if you were interested in buying apple shares at 500 that's precisely why you uh, bought the call option however you're not required to do that you don't uh, have to do it but if you wanted to do it uh, you could do it and you would do it because you would buy the shares at 500 and let's say you pay 10 dollars or 20 dollars for the, uh, as premium for that um, so your cost basis would have been 520 but now Apple's trading at 550. So it definitely makes sense for you to exercise your option. So if your option is in the money uh, and by the date of expiry, then your broker is going to automatically exercise that option for you unless you let them know ahead of time that you don't want to exercise it. You want to close it out for cash. So exercise is something uh, you would do when you're a buyer of options. Uh, similarly, on the put side, if you had a uh, put option, which is the right to sell a stock, and let's say the stock went down in value, but you have the right to sell it at the strike price at which you bought the put option for. Assignment is just the opposite of exercise. Exercise is done by a buyer, and assignment is, happens to a seller. So whenever you exercise something, that contract is then assigned on the seller side. So if you had a call option and you exercised it, then the seller would be assigned that contract and therefore they would be forced to sell their shares to you at the strike price. And on the put side, again, if you have the right to sell shares, then the seller of the option ha has the obligation to buy it from you uh, and they'll get assigned on that put option. So that's how ass assignment and uh, exercise works. Uh, volume and open interest, I'm going to take it up when we go into the uh, trading platform. Um, here we have a lot of order types and some of these order types are uh, similar to what you might have seen uh, when you were trading stocks. But let me just mention a brief uh, background on these uh, order types. A market order is something that you should never do, but a market order is you're telling your broker to execute this order right now at whatever market uh, is happening. So at, at whatever market prices are going on. So that's generally not advised because you're probably going to get uh, a pretty bad fill on your order. You always want to put in a limit order. So if, let's say if you're buying an option 
and the bid ask prices are $8 and $8.20, then you want to put in a bid order, you want to put in a limit order and say, I, I want to pay no more than $8 or I want to pay no more than $8.05, uh, things like that. So you want to make sure that your entry point is something that you control and not that is something uh, that is handed down uh, to you by your broker. So market orders is, is, uh, is something that is handed down to you by your broker. So you never want to get into a market order situation unless there's a very good reason for doing that. So let's say if the markets are crashing and you own some stock or you own some options and you, 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 know, you just want to get out of that position because you think uh, there's going to be further downside and you just want out, in which case a market order may make sense in that particular situation. A stop order in generally means um, it's generally used to stop your losses. So let's say you bought uh, a stock or an option, you bought it for $8, uh, but you put your stop order uh, and, and you put your stop price at say $750. So if, if at any time that option drops to $750, then your broker is going to execute that for you. So stop orders are generally used to limit your losses. Although stop orders can be used for buy orders also, but the most general application is that a stop order is used to uh, limit your losses. So on all these order types, you'll have to look at your particular trading platform and see what the implementation guidelines are because a lot of this stuff is very different from one platform to the other. A stop limit is also similar to a stop, but you also... Uh, put in a limit order at your stop. So, you know, you can put the stop order at $7.50 and then say my limit is $7.40. And so I don't want to sell it if it goes uh, below $7.40. Uh, whereas a regular stop order is a stop order that's a, that becomes a market order. So whatever the market is at that point, uh, your broker is going to execute that order for you. And then finally, we have conditional orders. Now, conditional orders are very uh, interesting. They are very uh, useful. And especially if you are uh, professionals having a day job and uh, you don't have time to look at the markets, uh, it's a good idea to learn about how conditional orders work because for your positions, you can set up certain conditional orders. And, um, and if any of those conditions get met, then your order will get executed. So it's a it's a way of risk management and it's a it's a way of automating your risk management approach. So conditional orders are pretty good. Um, I'll show you conditional orders in a later course, how we do it and uh, how we place those orders. Transaction costs are pretty straightforward. These are your brokerage costs. And in general, uh, in the options market, what you'll see is uh, pricing is based upon the number of contracts uh, you execute. So if you put in an order for 10 contracts, you bought 10 contracts, then you'll most of the time you'll see pricing based on uh, the number of uh, uh, pricing based on a contract basis. So it will be maybe $1 per contract or $1.25 per contract. Um, but always, you know, you want to keep your transaction cost uh, as low as possible. So as a general guideline, I can tell you that if you if uh, your broker is charging you no more than one dollar per contract then you're pretty good as far as transaction costs are concerned where transaction costs really become an issue is when you over trade so you're buying 10 contracts you're selling it you're buying 20 more and you're selling that and pretty soon you know your daily transaction costs are going to run into 50 or 100 dollars and that doesn't make sense because at the end of the day it's going to eat into your profits so always keep in mind that you need to create strategies uh, that can generate a good amount of profit. And of course, all strategies, if things go wrong, you have to adjust them, which is fine. But, you know, you shouldn't have to go in and come out and go in and come out and do these so many of these uh, round trip trades because that just adds up to your transaction costs. Let's talk about market makers because they are really interesting and, and uh, I'll tell you how they work in the options market. The options market, when it was first created, um, there was not enough liquidity because, you know, there was nobody on the other side to take the other side of your positions. So they created market makers. These are large firms. Their role is to provide liquidity in the marketplace. So if you wanted to buy an option, 
they'll take the other side of that trade. If you wanted to sell an option, they'll take the other side of that trade. And that's their job. They are required to provide liquidity to the marketplace. So most of the time, you have to bear in mind you're dealing with a market maker. You're not dealing with another trader. In the options market, almost 100% of the time, you're dealing with a market maker. So these guys are very sharp. They know exactly uh, what, you know, what their positions are. You can imagine they're taking orders from not just you, but thousands of other people. So they're managing their order book so efficiently and they manage to make money out of that. So you must imagine these guys are um, extremely uh, competent options traders and they can see the order flow coming in. They can see what kind of supply and demand exists in the marketplace. They can tweak the prices. They can, uh, they can expand the bid and ask price so that you, know, you have to buy at one price and you have to sell at another price. They make their uh, profits through uh, mechanisms like that. So they are very important uh, and if you put in your order and you don't get a fill, that means the market maker is not happy with your order. He, you know, he doesn't like your limit price and you may have to either uh, you know, reduce it or increase it, whatever. But always remember, you're dealing with market makers and the market makers determine what prices are going to show up on the options that you want to buy or sell. Finally, we have margins and there are two types of margins in options and one is called a regulation T or it, it, the short form is reg T and most new traders will have to go into a reg T margin. So in a reg T margin, um, whenever you buy options, you have to put up the entire cost of the option because uh, that's your maximum loss and the broker wants the entire amount. When you're selling options like we've seen before, the margins are going to be huge and there are certain brokers who may not even let you sell options on a naked basis. You, you, you will have to sell it as a spread. So, but that's the way regulation T margin is uh, designed. It's designed to control risk at your end and it's designed to control risk at your broker's end. There is another type of margin that, are, that is available for advanced option traders and that's called portfolio margin. Um, in portfolio margin, you're not margined on, on individual positions. You're margined on your portfolio as a whole. Uh, that's a more, much more advanced uh, type of uh, uh, margin. And what you'll see is that you have to pass an exam and uh, brokers like think, think or Swim have an exam that you have to pass before they can allocate portfolio margin to your account. And there are also minimum uh, requirements in a portfolio margin account. So. I believe uh, some brokers have a minimum of $100,000 and other brokers have a minimum of $125,000 required in your account to have portfolio margin. So if you do get very advanced uh, in options trading, uh, you can apply to your broker. You can, uh, and, but not all brokers have portfolio margin. So, you know, if this is something that you feel you might be interested in the future, it may make sense to determine front whether this whether your broker has portfolio margin facility if they don't then you should move over to a broker that has it i know think or swim definitely has it trade king has it and a few others also have it but not everybody has it so now in the next lecture we're going to go into the trading platform and we're going to look at uh, the bid price ask price mark price uh, the expiry series uh, the volume and the open interest and then I'll explain all of these parameters uh, on the trading platform itself.